re recording here. So uh, next session with Ashwin. Okay, so t where, tell me where you're at on um, on um, bill of materials stuff and where progress free CAD. Just so we can uh, continue. One thing I did want to bring up is regarding a basically milestone schedule for for the whole year because. You want to be at the end of the year and, and actually operating a successful enterprise. So we want to set some milestones for what that looks like. We typically use um, uh, it's a critical path document. It's a, an editable kind of a map milestones map for for the whole year, so that you're aware of the basic points where you have to be, and then you can also evaluate that and keep changing that as time goes on as you find out new things. So it's a live working document which helps you plan. So. So hopefully maybe we can, I'd like to get into that today if we could, uh, but otherwise let me, let me know uh, where you're at. Uh, the first thing I, I looked at was actually trying to get access to post on uh, Ashwin log, I mean the OSC log. For some reason that is not happening. I downloaded a software. So that is something I need your help on. Okay, secondly, so, I, okay. secondly, I uh, got back to the uh, free cat badge, OSC badge. So there I have covered the Sketcher Workbench completely. All of my presentations are available on the link that I sent to you. Plus the first presentation which is 20 minutes long. These are smaller presentations. They take one tool on the toolbar at a time and describe that. Because I realized it is better to do sprints than do one marathon. Take one tool on the toolbar, do dub 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 rather than do, do one big toolbar. You know, entire thing. So the shorter videos they give you. So. I'm done with that. I'm going to the next part of it, which I think is the uh, uh, component. Uh, there is there's another workbench. I forgot the name. Uh, the second workbench that lets you create three-dimensional parts. So I am uh, currently focusing on the FreeCAD uh, FreeCAD OSC batch, going through that journey. And I got back to the local supplier. I told them, look, even if it takes time, uh, I'll buy it from you. You please uh, decide the uh, bomb and uh, let me know the parts. Except for the uh, aluminium uh, uh, heater, uh, the last part, the extruder part of the last part that we discussed. Other than that, the remaining parts I am going to get from him. He said he will get back on that. I am not going to because we are going to lose time here if I try to do everything myself. I thought maybe I should uh, offload that work to him, buy from him the first time, get a printer working, get my confidence. And uh, first time I will buy it from him, next time I will source parts differently. So, so I mean, have you got... Good idea? Have you gone through enough detail through it to make sure that he's got all the right parts, or how how are you approaching that? How how do you know which which of the things are right? Because we were working on a document, the basically the admissible parts list, where we talk about what works and what doesn't. How how are you sure that everything's going to be the right parts? Uh, after I submitted to you the initial bomb, uh, you said uh, there were some things that had to change because the heater sink was there that had to. Yeah. Uh, I will send him that email. That part I couldn't send yesterday. I'll send him that email today. And I'll have him uh, have a better pair of better placed pair of eyes take a look at it. So that he'll tell me, okay, this is fine. We'll go with it. Yeah. And once he supplies the parts, I'll show you the parts before I buy from him. And if that is fine, we'll go ahead and build the printer. Okay. Okay. Right. So, so you'll show me the final. You'll show me the final parts after, before you buy yeah. them. Yeah. 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 Because, like, for example, to give you one example, like if you look at the, the controller, the controller you pointed to. And I don't know if you have you don't have the stuff we have here, but it was one board that had both the Arduino and like the the power controller on it on one board. I mean, it it would work, but you'd pretty much have to redesign the controller because it wouldn't fit in a way we're mounting it. The connections are different, wires might be different. So it's like you gotta, of course, you gotta have the same parts unless you're just uh, doing something, just redeveloping. But if you have the parts, of course you want to do it. If you don't have the parts, then you have to redevelop. But stick with the parts we, we have exactly. Otherwise, you're adding a, a lot of time to redesign work. Yeah. So uh, sometimes if I do it, yeah. sometimes if I do it one way, and basically, as you said, if I take one board which has got uh, both the uh, Arduino and the power controller, and let you say, Ashwin, this is wrong. Let's replace it. Maybe I can take it apart, assuming I got it wrong initially. Not that I intentionally go that way, not that I intentionally go to that way, but I should have got it wrong initially. I'll take it apart, buy the other part, put it in and get it working the OSC way. Because at the end of it, one year later, I want to get the OSC course, you know, mentorship, certification, whatever you call it. I want to take that path. 
rather than trying to deviate. If OSC has established a path, I want to go that path and uh, comply to what the OSC says that this is the way we do things is what needs to be done. So what I'm saying is, even if by mistake I end up using the wrong parts, last time you told me that OSC 3D printers are modular. Once you put them together, you can take them apart. Yeah. And once you take apart, you told me last time. So yeah. I'll take out one part, I'll put in the other. So that extra expense is not a problem for me. Okay. I will not, you know. Okay. The, the other aspect of expense is the time. So in other words, if you have to do redesign, it's so, so that's why I wanted to do the basically the critical path so we kind of have good mile points to say okay we're we're where we need to be yep okay that's that's fair like yeah if you, especially if you show me the parts before you get them then i can uh, just go through all of that yeah okay sounds good to me mm -hmm. let's see anything else what else uh so you said uh, let's so should we go to the now are you telling me that okay i see the once again the regarding your log let's try to solve that but you're saying one side is the just logging the hours right and as far as that have you been able to you've been going pretty much full time so you're doing like 40 hours a week or more no i have not been putting 40 hours a week but uh, uh i would say last two days maybe uh, uh yesterday I spent four hours prior to that maybe previous day two or two hours I was in the hospital but what I'll uh, aim is every uh, week, seven days, I'll accumulate 40 hours there, every week. Ideally, nine to five, five days a week, eight hours a day. But if one of the days, if, if flexi timing is allowed, maybe if I spend four hours a day, I'll make up with the four hours on the weekend. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But you're but saying, so I basically put in your hours for the last week, but you're saying that log is still not working for you? I, sp I spent a lot of time trying to get that to work and uh, since I come from a software background, I shouldn't be expecting help, but you know, I'm in out of touch with those kinds of things for quite a while now, but I'm just not able to get it to work. The other option is there's a software called Postman. Postman is a browser-like software that helps me debug the server requests and responses. I've been trying that, so, I'd, uh, so uh, I'll parallel continue that once I'm done with the OSC uh, batch thing. Right, free right. Yeah. Free yeah, free CAD, milestone. Yeah, free CAD, free CAD badge. Yeah. Uh, what? What's it remind me what software experience you have. A software, sixteen years. And what, so, what, what, what programming languages mostly? Uh, I've done Java. I've done Flex. Uh, uh, web programming, Java server side programming, architecture design, project management. Any any Python in there or? No. No Python? Okay. Okay, cool. But yeah, yeah, yeah that's good. Um, okay. But, but if resources have to be hired here. Sorry. If resources are hard to be hired here, it is easy to hire here because they are much cheaper here. As opposed to hiring in the US or UK, they are very, very expensive there. Resources are very expensive in US and UK. It is much cheaper here. Yeah, yeah. But again, here, it's on a case by case basis. Most of the, res the resources have to be trained. Okay. And basically, usually get uh, low quality resources, not very high quality. Okay. Some of them are high quality. Let's. Uh, Some of them are high quality, but not professional. Again, those kinds of things are very common here. You know. Okay. Let's switch to uh, just just regarding the wiki. So, uh, how about the wiki? I mean, you you don't have troubles uh, editing the wiki, do you? When you go into because one thing is the, just the log itself, but then it's the edit, like we did last time, where you're editing just the wiki. So, are you having in issues with that? Yes, I'm just not able to ent uh, enter hours of the wiki or enter uh, the effort that I've put in towards various tasks of the wiki. And I, I gave it a lot of try even yesterday and day before yesterday. Uh, apart from the hours I put on uh, the free cat thing. But I'm just not able to get it working. I, I, I even look for media wiki, CSRF, whether or not sure if it was a server side setting or, you know, I'm just trying to guess, think loudly. Not trying to say that there's a service at issue. But basically, the what I can do is I can uh, you know try with the postman and find out where the issue is. Postman is a software that lets me debug the, what is going on. Okay. Okay, but but I mean you should not have issues editing the wiki itself. C can you maybe share your screen and let's try that? Yeah, uh, I will share my screen. How do I do that? Yeah. Is it it's open and close? Share your screen. Share your screen. Mm -hmm. So I say share. 
let's say share audio is it no this is share no okay. so we are here now like say sorry okay so go to your log go to my log which is wiki dot action log okay okay we got to log in shall i put a test log entry yeah okay try that right now test log entry but you got to put in hours too okay so select a few hours okay okay cool that's fine but now okay so that's the log part which is an embedded thing but then go up to the top of the page and and log in and edit so oh, i'm sorry yeah uh, we are supposed to log in every second i'm correct so yeah so, so that you can now you can edit the wiki so you said you you did some work on some other instructionals so i i would be expecting <clears throat> for you to so no go below that go go down no 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 that has nothing to do with logging in that's an independent thing so okay. so go down scroll down scroll down so you see i started editing on Fe february 25 so go up just a little bit february 25 yeah um, i just started that. That. but you can edit that so so can you put your links you said you did some of the videos like for example the videos with free cat and everything can you just put yeah. links to that cuz that's Let what me see edit this page yeah you just click at it there uh yeah. let let shall i just put test for example yeah yes to see yeah look it works then uh, how come this code this is an embedded uh, to gadget is it embedded to yeah, it's an embedded, embedded gadget if, so um yeah that's a separate thing that's 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 where you're logging where another yeah it's an embed and that's not just not working but otherwise yeah. you can definitely log so what you need to be doing is put all your links there and if you put a link to another page like for example go if you look at how do you get the hyperlink to show up well any page on the wiki if it's within double brackets it's it turns into a hyperlink okay let me put it right in front of you here but uh, fe uh, i'll put a gmail in fact uh, i'm going to access that from desktop facebook but mobile facebook i get two profiles one as a teaching one one as a regular profile so mm -hmm. surprisingly the uh, the uh, content creator page on facebook in my limited experience it looks lower than the regular you know uh, personal facebook uh, uploads i don't know but that's what i'm thinking it looks lower I will see edit, which I go to February twenty fifth. I go to February twenty eighteenth. Here we had eighteenth. Where is thirteen? Let me do a refresh. Sorry, back to your screen. So here I will go and say edit. Then you said within double brackets or double angular brackets. What I think that becomes no, the link. No square brackets. Double square bracket. No, 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 no. No, that that's different. I'm saying double bracket applies to when there's any page on the wiki, like for example Ashwin log. If you put a double bracket, like say, okay, try this. Try try star double bracket. Star double bracket. And then type in MJ log, so you you get a link to my log. Mm-hmm. Double bracket. So see what that did. I would say save at the bottom. Yeah. Yeah. So see, so that it turns into a hyperlink because that's that's a page on a wiki. So that's how that works. Okay. That some that becomes a placeholder for some variable that points to MJ log. Okay, okay. Well, MJ log yeah. is a page on the wiki already, so that turned into a wiki link that already exists. But if you don't, ha if you start another page that doesn't have anything in there, then then yeah, you can create pages that way. And when you click on it, it'll have an empty page that you can start editing. So that's the thing. Um, oh, so the Ashwin yeah. teaches that you put some some links there. Yeah. Uh, okay. When I go here, uh, there are eight or nine short videos. Of, uh, I'll click on the videos here, for example, and uh, here uh, each of those are two. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. Okay. Cool. Sorry, it doesn't sound silly. Okay, that's that's cool, uh, and also you can. Um, 
Let's see, does that have an embed link? Yeah, I could actually embed that. You, you know, you can also embed that in a wiki if you like, if you want to put a specific video. Like for example, um, yeah. copy code, iframe. What I thought was rather than one long video, maybe it is better two minute, three minute short font snippets that you know. Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's good. Um, but let me show you, for example, how I went to your your Facebook and then I copied a, a code and then I, I'll put I'll put that as an embed right on the log so I, I gotta put in between, in between HTML tags but take a look at that on your log if you refresh um, I just embedded your your post um, let's see if I can reduce the height that's a little Thank you, Vashan. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Key sent it at the airport. At Bakariya, right? Huh? Kaki, Kaki. Six hundred. Sorry, Vashan. Just one second. Yep. Thank you. something like that uh, it doesn't really embed so great I'm trying to play with that but yeah so you can do things like that. you can be embedding different content or you can just put the links in there that's good so yeah okay cool but that's that's what I mean like uh, you can do that kind of logging right there already okay let's do let's do one thing with the critical path regarding getting you up to uh, up to speed on let, let's actually work on a collaborative um, collaboratively on the critical path. So I'm going to put a link on your log which states let me share my screen with you so you can see what what I'm doing. Let's say stop sharing. Yeah. Or takes or automatically. Yeah. So I'm going to share share your screen. So I'm going to share here. So what I'll do is uh, I'll put in uh, you can see my screen. based on there's also another page about the mentorship there's a like a generic schedule that I put under the mentorship page which talks about um, production immersion training OC chapter training. I want you to take a look at that. So it's kind of like the generic thing that we want to adapt to your program. So what I'm doing here, so as you see here, Ashwin Critical Path has it's red, so that means there's nothing there. Um, so that means if I click it, I can start editing it. What it will do is, so there's a page called Critical Path, and we can use one of the documents there as a template. So I can, for example, take take a look at it. okay that, that's decent the critical thing is t that you have a timeline and then ev things are based on this timelines here was like 2020 November through September items that you want to do so I'll, I'll take this I'll edit that make a copy let's see make a copy so I'll take this and I'm gonna say make a copy of just the selected slide right there and we'll call that Ashwin um, critical path and then that's going to be open for you to edit. But here it is, and the sharing permissions, make sure it exists there so that anyone can edit it. Anyone on the internet can find and view, so I'm going to say edit. 
And the, the important thing about this editable part is that if you see that you missed the schedule or you need to update anything, then you can do that. So I will embed this into the wiki and I have this template called, um, if you understand this syntax, it's embed. So I'm substituting this embed template in here. Which is this all media wiki uh, or, uh, lingo or uh, yeah. you know, syntax? Yeah, that's MediaWiki, and it, when I did the substitution there, it gave me this template, so I can put in the standard format of how we publish a document, like we talked about last time. So you can do small, publish, okay, embed, and then that. So now on, on the wiki page, we've got this embedded right there with the edit right underneath. So now, where is this linked from? So I'm actually going to link, link this, but I'm going to put a link so for others they could see it, where it came from. It's Ashwin Log, or I'll also link to Critical Path since that's a page you might want to look at as well. Um, so there, <coughs> the typical planning consists of things like a critical path, but a roadmap, I'll also put a link to the roadmap here, that's kind of a more generic uh, till 2028 finishing the GVCS so we can create applications like creating education facilities, farms, villages, hospitals and reinventing all infrastructures of civilization uh, on the roadmap. There's also if you want to see how the 3D printer roadmap looks like uh, there's a special one for the 3D printer uh, to sp and we should have a roadmap for every project. And last time we started your, uh, by the way, um, your development D3D Pro V2102, so last time we learned about how you can seed an entire template for what you've got going on your side. Uh, but anyway, let's going back to the critical path. I just want to show you just a little bit about roadmap. If you haven't looked at the page yet, there's a big hairy 20-year milestone map. That's kind of generic, like um, where we talk about some of the main things. And here we're we're in 2020, 21. Oh man, we're supposed to be doing various things. We're missing some deadlines, but altogether this is kind of a generic, um, generic path to. 2035 actually not 2028 20 2028 is kind of the more recent estimate for completion of the GVCS so that's that's uh, made like big picture milestones and it's kind of roughly following this guideline but let's take a look at also uh, the 3d printer roadmap specifically uh, so some what are some of the things on the 3d printer well, in 2016 is when we started the, the printer. We did a first workshop around that time. Um, we started running workshops around that. And there's a lot of, uh, a lot of different things. 2016, while we started on working on 3D printers, a little later than that, and it actually doesn't have, this doesn't actually have dates, so it's not like a critical path. It's more like the generic uh, steps that we get to and here I kind of have 2025 as the end but OSC 3D printer design developed so that means um, a few years ago we developed our own design it was I think like 2017 mm -hmm. um, then we talk about what are some of the other milestones full 3D printer scalability so yes we did that we've demonstrated that we can do either longer axes or using larger universal axis designs like the one inch or even two inch universal axis so we've worked on that um, 3D printed polycarbonate gl glazing, uh, we haven't done that. 3D printed rubber tracks and wheels, we've done a little bit on rubber, uh, printing rubber belts, um, but not really at the rubber tracks yet. Uh, and then there's all these other things that come out along with the 3D printer, along with things like um, 3D printer filament extrusion, so that means making our own filament. Plastic profile mm -hmm. extrusion could be a milestone. And this, this definitely, but I mean, plastic profiles, right now we're sticking to just 3D printing, not like extruding profiles, but pretty much printing them out so we can generate effectively any kind of profile through the 
3D printing extr extrusion. Plastic shredding that goes with it. So like some of the most important, the plastic shredder yeah. and uh, <clears throat> 3D printer filament making. So we can produce like a lot of stuff for construction too. Like for example, today, uh, just to give you an example, um, well, you want to print larger things for for construction such as foundation forms or even whole house panels that means you gotta reach the scalability and build a much larger 3d printer which we haven't done yet but today just as a an aside here um, if you look at my log I, I had a concept of how you would do um, open source live tap connector so this is another thing in construction so this is actually a concept design of if you have fat power cables how do you tap them without breaking the cables like because actually that's a real situation we've got right now we've got power going to the new house where we need temporary powerful for tools without so without sh shutting down the whole uh, whole electrical grid here at our facility we can do this live piercing connector which essentially consists of a 3d printed structure that's got these piercing nails that that way when you put this entire assembly over the wire you can clamp it down and you can actually make a connection so you can put wire in there to feed power tools or whatever while working with this live so you're not going to get shocked by this but that's like a perfect case for <coughs> where 3d printing is a practical application because otherwise i'd have to go to the store get one of these they might be like 20 bucks or 30 bucks uh, you know I, I could print it for like 50 cents here and have it done like have it done tomorrow here instead of going having to drive down to the store or whatever so things like that become practical in construction just as a sideline of, of a practical application of 3d printing today um anyway um bunch of uh, like the main things within this roadmap i would say the 3d printer filament extrusion part is super yeah. important um and this is a also a working doc like i can actually edit this if i want to i'm not going to do much much editing but i would i would uh the only thing i would do here is like really emphasize that that is a very important milestone which one the filament extrusion yeah we're making our own filament from waste plastic so that means we're doing plastic shredding much about the first one, I think you told me something else that certain kind of plastic, there is currently no method open source to, I mean, you said something around those lines. Is that also solved? Sorry, uh, repeat uh, the question? I'm sorry, I think in the first call you said there's a certain kind of plastic where uh, reusing that as filament or something is still not open source or still not researched and uh, wow. that will greatly... That will, oh yeah there's two thing, two major milestones on 3d printing and i think i was referring to more of uh, the high temperature 3d printing was that what we we're talking about maybe certain kind of plastics i think that can't that yeah. are currently not okay, okay. yeah i mean right now with respect to the plastic recycling and extrusion there's not really any great open source and well-developed pathways where you can get anything from waste plastic because typically what people do is they use pellets you can you can get some filament makers off the shelf right now that work with pellets but I haven't really seen anything yet that works well on if you just grind plastic that you just shred you shred plastic and then use it in an ex a filament maker because that's that's rougher it's not as precise as the little pellets and it just doesn't work yet so that's one thing to develop and the print the the plastics what I, I think the point I was making that a lot of times you want to have a high temperature print chamber where that allows you to print not just with the very common things like PLA or ABS but also with any other high temperature plastics that are either hard to print, they warp a lot, or they don't stick to the bed, or simply require a very high temperature. So for example, things like acetal for making bearings, or PEI, which is the stuff that the prints, print bed is, is made of right now. That's actually a thermoplastic, so we can be printing that, but uh, you, as you would see, because we're printing on it right now, and it doesn't melt that means actually to extrude it and print it would require much much higher temperature than our current printer uh, works at so that's examples and then there's other things like for example polyethylene which is one of the most very very common plastics on earth 
Um, if you look at um, what are the most common plastics, um, what is Google it? What is the most common plastic? Okay. Because you got to be able to print with the most common plastic. Well, it's polyethylene. Mo the largest volume of plastic on this planet is polyethylene. But you can't really print it because it warps a lot and it's hard to stick to the bed. So for this, for example, you need a high temperature chamber. So I don't know anybody that's printing with polyethylene right now. You might have industrial enclosed printers that do it, but nothing in the open source that has that kind of capacity and it's yet it's the most common plastic so we got to be able to do that because it's very common and accessible to everybody but that's so that's some of the milestones like here i didn't even let's see did i put the high temperature i don't see it here so i'm actually going to make a note here that i need to update this because definitely the roadmap roadmap must include a high temperature chamber so back when you know back when I drew this up maybe around 2016 or so um, or a few years ago that wasn't even on my radar because I didn't really appreciate how difficult it was to print with any of the other plastics so so definitely I'm gonna just say definitely include high temperature print chamber so I need to add that okay but let's let's get out of that because I wanted to basically put a few basic milestones on your roadmap. So here, if I refresh this, you should see actually see this change. Yep. So, you know, that's the cool thing about the wiki. You can see that these changes like I just added that in there. Um, okay, but let's go to Ashwin Log and while well, we just were on your critical path. So this is what we want to do right now. So I want you to go in there to your log and edit this with me. So this was, we're going to say this is Ashwin Log, so go in there. And we're going to stick to the green bubbles. Do you want me to open my wiki and just go, the go into this document? Go into your, your log and click edit on this document. So I want you to edit this with me so we can do this. And here we're going to say 2021. No, oops. Which page is this? So here you are on Ashwin Critical Path is, I do not. Yeah, click edit below the doc. Critical Path, yeah, yeah, yeah. That link. Okay. I'll click edit. Yeah. I come here. Okay. There you go. So now you can edit this with me. So for example, control C and control V on the on this, so this is our mouse. Right, so okay, click on that control C, control V. Uh, control C control V. So so I right click and I'll say copy. Copy. I'll, I'll, yeah, it's already, a copy is already made in fact. Well, I did it. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, the control V. There so. you go. Okay, so you know how to make copies. So here on the bottom, first of all, is, uh, let's start with, we're in February. We're in Feb. We're March, April. So kind of want to do March. April. So July, so we're in 2021 here. Okay, so what's the first milestone? So the first milestone around, and, and you can do, you know, you can put the milestone probably like at the beginning of the milestone you can put yeah. lines such as put a say a vertical line here to mark that you're gonna start that on. So right now, what what are you doing? What's what's this? Bill of materials, material sourcing, right? Yeah. Okay, so we're doing that in February and into March. How long do you think that's gonna take? Right? We don't know. We'll, we'll see. But we know the next thing is. What's the next thing after that? What are you going to do? 
Uh, build the 3D printer once I get the materials. Okay, write it in there. Uh, write it in there. Okay. Yeah. Am I writing the right place? So. Okay. Yeah, you should you should yeah. be able to just take all those yeah, and yeah. click it. Yeah, click it. I'll have double click. click. Mm -hmm. Oh. So build the B three D Pro or B three D Universal. Uh, probably Pro. You probably want to do oh. the the good one right away. Pro ready right Yeah. FreeCAD badge. You want to get work on the FreeCAD badge. You want to do. Much in one question, sorry. Mm -hmm. Maybe after this. Maybe after this. Go ahead. So you want to build it, but then you want to get like, there's also things like data collection, like performance data. How do you know that this thing is working? So we want to basically collect data to draw up a complete specification like so once you have the printer you you want to collect data like okay this is the maximum speed that we can print at this is the actual extrusion rate per 24 hours this is the actual measured accuracy and and squareness of the parts and various details and you can also test okay I'm able to print with X materials PLA I can do TPU or I can do ABS and for each one of those you you might you know just might make notes so that we're getting data that you, you look at the printer you say oh, okay these guys actually took data and they have real performance results including things like how fast that does, does the temperature heat up? What are the temperatures uh, that are acceptable? Do we have like high temperature nozzles and what temperature do they work at? Um, other things like all kinds of details, right? So we, we want to collect this data to draw up a complete specification where right now we have a pretty gener generic specification, but there's a lot of detail. Like if you, I think if you detail this in a lot of detail, yeah. Then you can have a very significant value proposition. Like when you go on to make your first sale, you can say, "Hey, this is our performance specifications. We can achieve exactly this, and here's right. how." Um, so, so that's the shakedown. And once you get to this point, you can do. Uh, here you probably do so build a D three D Pro. But once you build it, it's like print quality optimization. And that's when you're taking your data. Okay. And then, but probably, uh, so at the point, at the point where you're, you've got a pretty good confidence that you're, you're able to do replicable printing and we've solved any issues like, okay, here's how you guarantee that that the printer is always uh, leveled and things like that. It's a lot of details there, but that that'll be the, the kind of the shakedown to the point that you can get really good at getting replicable results. Now, how many replications of the printer do you probably want to do? Like, if you do the first printer and it works well, you probably want to build a few more. Um, but that will take you like a week's time, like if you want to replicate a printer. So I'll do like maybe a uh, replicate. But much of that uh, Lattice 3D is affordable, right? I mean, uh, not on an OSC worldwide scale, but basically if it is very affordable or there's a cheap alternative, once a person builds a printer, maybe replicating it can be faster because I can hire somebody to, to take up 3D instructions and build it step by step. Yeah. So maybe. Yeah, yeah. Maybe. So maybe that's like, yeah, yeah, of course we can. Uh, so the no answer was actually much better. I asked a few people here. Uh, one of them is supposed to get better. There's an open source 3D interactive way of doing it, right? But oh. a 3D printer will be faster because all they have to do is blindly follow instructions without even, you know, yeah, yeah. taking too much. Yeah. And the other thing is, um, I'd say, like, you want to work on a full CAD model like a complete one that's got 
That's more detailed than any ones that we have already. You think you you could do that? Yeah, I'll do that. I'll do that. That documenting is very important because yeah. more if somebody has to replicate without using their brain. I mean, I mean, exactly. what I'm saying is without uh, involving any guesswork into the process. Oh yeah. Step by step, do it. Then there has to be, you know, a step by step uh, way of doing it where somebody reads the instruction and does it. Yeah. Full build instructions and pretty much like here. I mean, you can do as many. You know, you can be getting people to replicate it, and you can test test your procedures and stuff like that. I mean, you don't have to do it. You can you can get others to do that with you. And that's Imagine a few yep. Sorry. Yep. Go ahead. Uh, a few discussion or a few questions. One thing is this: one. LabFrap 3D printer, self self printing 3D printer. I tried googling the uh, ours versus that one. I mean, how are these two different? Uh, you know. Uh, RepRap is a generic name for <clears throat> the whole RepRap project, and, um, so I think that's the distinction that RepRap is the name of a project. And then they produced a few printers, but then since then everyone took those designs and made like a hundred different ones. Ours is a RepRap derivative, there's Prusa, there's Lulzbot, there's Ultimaker, all these projects came out of RepRap, basically the open source info that was contained within the RepRap project. Does that explain? Imagine if yeah. like somewhere this genealogy or this history of uh, right from RepRap somewhere of a tree or a right up somewhere that I can check on Google or who is inside or? Uh, you're asking uh, where the genealogy yeah. page is? Right on Google about this kind of a history that you mentioned ours and the other printers derived from oh, RepRap yeah. initially. Where, where do you hear about it? I mean, there's, so if you, if you look at the RepRap wiki, Okay, I'll do that. I'll do that. That's probably the best thing. Okay. You can search for the history. Like, I don't know if they have any. So take yeah. take a look at that. I'll put that on your log there. Um, but they probably have some articles on the history of the RepRap. Just Google that. What's the history of the RepRap project? Um, yeah. I know that since I've been observing that for a long time, it's basically some people, they, they made it, the first RepRap, and it you know it was decent and they made next version and then the next version and uh, by that time like the this so-called central rep rep project i mean it just forked into like hundreds of people making printers you know so okay. that's kind of the generic history and then you can get into details but then there's one more hardware project uh, that actually uh, uh, became closed source after the okay there was some FYI that I mentioned not FYI FYI Maybe what's FYI? Uh, sorry, what what does FYA mean? Yeah, for your attention, for yeah, your for information. information. Okay, yep. Okay. But, but coming back, few more questions here. One yeah. thing is the 3D printer sale because I know one guy here who locally runs a company. Now, basically, if, if I get to the sales part of it, then the way I see it is in this one year engagement, uh, one thing is learning how to build things. And there are two things here. There's a broad learning, there's a deep learning. Broad learning means I get to learn to build various things, for example, like the uh, brick maker or the tractor or the 3D printer. Deep learning means Specially specialized focus on uh, printers and extrusion and various kinds of plastics. That is a deep learning. The other aspect is entrepreneurship and basically the printer, uh, the sales or the running a company, running an industry come. Yep. There are three different parts here, the way I'm saying it. Maybe at least for now I'll leave out the sales and uh, building the business part. Uh, but in terms, if I have to focus this one year in terms of learning, do you suggest that I focus on the deep learning thing or the broad learning thing where I learn to build a variety of different things? What's your question? What's your question? Uh, the, the way I see this critical path of one year is there are three options. Uh, one thing is uh, entirely research, which is basically either broad research or deep research, which is research meaning learning from you, learning from OSA. So broad research means I get to learn to build various things, not just creative printers. I get to learn to build tractors, brick makers, and uh, maybe other things, for example. Uh, deep learning means just take the 3D printer, spend a lot of time on it, research in the sense of how to burn various kinds of plastics, improve the speed of extrusion. You know, you, you take one particular product and goes, uh, you walk in that direction a lot. 
Broad learning means you take up various products, you walk a little in every direction, like tractor, for example, or a brick maker, for example, or 3D printer, all three of them. If I leave out the sales and entrepreneurship and business management, uh, the uh, uh, MBA part, which pro probably I could leave out in one year because that will take away the time that I need here for other things. That will suck my time out of, out of this learning period. How do you, what do you think is the right? What's the right mix? Sorry? You're asking what is the right mix? Uh, out of these three paths, which is the right path? Well, the the thing is, that really depends on, I mean, the idea is that you're getting to a successful enterprise, then that allows you, to get you the, the sustainable funding to continue on a project. So I would say after we have reached kind of like, so with this line here, like if you're looking at the critical path, um, once you get the first printer sell, I mean, okay, great but when does it become a su sustainable business so at the point like after that you can be talking about when is the point where you've got a sustainable business because if you've got that then you can do anything but the question is how long does it take you to get to this point not the first printer sale but a successful enterprise and that could be with with just making 3D printers. It could be running workshops. It could be other various services. It could be like a printing printing uh, operation where you actually print parts. It could be various things which we haven't really um, determined yet. But we do know that it does start with making a working printer because that's the hardware. We don't want to omit that. You we want everybody to be able to build things and then build goods other goods and services around the physical products as the general strategy so so i'm going to put like a big question mark here when is that point that you have a successful enterprise that will determine what of the three things you mentioned you're going to be able to do if this thing this this successful enterprise is sooner than later then you, I mean, I would focus most energy until you get to this point. Focus all of your energy on that. Which one, sorry? Oh. On the successful enterprise. Imagine uh, uh, two points here. One thing is, 3D printing is obviously the future there. And uh, the second thing is, right now, India moves way behind the West in terms of any kind of development. For example, a lot of people here, I found out yesterday, my friend was building a house in a different state. He plans to go to China because what he is buying here, their available home construction goods are available at one tenth the cost and uh, in China. So here, even for example, 3D printers, what people are doing, oh, even, even in uh, retailing, what people do is they simply import from China and sell here. So they're making a lot of money there. The, the point I'm trying to make is 3D printing it will take a lot more time to evolve in India because India is so much more slower. India is more of a, it's a skilled labor kind of country where Western companies come and actually give work and get work done. The market has still not evolved to 3D printing plus the big players don't want to bring it here or, you know, they are happy, with, they are using it. There are companies with uh, uh, big companies that are nothing millions into you know, i think into metal 3d printing not just plastic 3d right. printing but wherein it becomes for example in canada for example in canada you go to a footwear shop they scan your feet and they give you 3d printed footwear now nobody wants to bring that awareness here and you uh, if they know it or that does not that's not going to come here at least for the next 10 years it's it's very slow here for that to evolve here so the way I thought was, if I to build a successful enterprise, let me build what sells here, yeah. rather than trying to ch uh, change the trend here because big players won't let you change the trend here. It's not going to acceptance will not come so easily, or it will take a lot of time. Right. So what is uh, what is that that you think would work? Because that's what we want to base the critical path around. So what do you think that would be? Please give me some time around that because one thing to do is if there's an already established market, uh, compete in that market. Otherwise, for that matter, even 3D printed shoes may make a, actually a lot of difference here because everybody gets a different pair and that actually work out here, for example, for example. So unless I step into the water, I won't know whether it's actually, you know, unless I actually try it out, I won't know 
But as you said, let us start off with a 3D printer. Let us come to a point wherein I build a 3D printer. But uh, rather than building a successful enterprise, which you know, the fad currently in India uh, market is basically yeah. that uh, rich people who are investors they become more selfish. There is this concept of asset-light scalable business, wherein they want minimal investment by a startup company, and they want to see an MVP, a uh, most uh, uh, product that sells minimal viable product or something. And then once they see the product that sells, they want to fund them so that it becomes a asset-light scalable business. For example, you have DoorDash in America, I think, where food delivery happens home. DoorDash, I think. And uh, here, for example, with the advent of the internet, a lot of the education has become home-based thanks to lockdown also. So people are competing in the education space because internet costs nothing. Everybody has a mobile phone. So there they are looking for startup ideas. So uh, the point I, the point I should, uh, I'm making is maybe let us start off with a 3D printer and uh, maybe let me work on uh, a broader set of products like the tractor, the bricklayer. And, uh, uh, the say uh, one year later I can look at the sales part or initially I'll partner with somebody here and ask them to look at the sales or the management part. I'll focus more on the research part. Yeah, so you're saying oh well so put that into your um so you, you don't like this, so so uh put what you want because this is about you succeeding on this. So we've got you know, we've got this one one year that we wanna map out. Um yeah. so maybe maybe this is not it. Maybe that's not maybe that's not it. So you you tell me. So we know. You we, ask me the first time actually how much runway time do I have? Uh, I mean, how much time I can stay without revenue? I can easily say six months to one year, not a problem. As long as I'm building here, I can actually find a partner parallel to, you know. Yeah. Because yeah. in any I company, mean, we, we need three. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, one, one way is that we develop the the printer and that means you're contributing a lot of different development like, you know, uh, documentation, functionality, maybe some new features. Uh, that's all progress so yeah but I mean if you want to uh, diversify into other things and then talk about maybe just partnering with somebody and and you're not doing that but somebody else is doing that 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 works I mean it's all it's yeah. all good but what I'm asking you is basically think about that and and put some more bubbles onto this graph I mean here we've got you know we're kind of saying we've got a few months here so February March April May, June, July, the way we kind of framed it out is like the first half of the year, it's like, okay, you've built the printers and possibly replicated them. I'm open to whatever whatever happens after that, uh, given that you have the you know, the one year of what, what we agreed to do so far. And then of course we can talk about what's after that and uh, how we want to ext extend that or go into different directions or whatever. But right now within the mentorship, it would be like, you basically have me for a year to, to see what we can do. And, and I, I'm, I'm just saying that, yeah, get that enterprise going because that way you have cash flow. Um, now, if you, if you want to say, okay, I built the printer and I can have basic functionality of that, but I'm not necessarily developing an enterprise, you can say, well, okay, I got some basic experience on building. Now I also have the ability to use uh, a 3D printer. But you yeah. might want to say, okay, I want to go right to the tractors at that point because I, I really find that more interesting. Yeah, you can do that. I mean, we want to. We're going to be building the tractor, the, the next iteration of the tractor this year. Um, that's going to be of the summer of extreme design build. That's which is September, October, November, as it stands right now which we haven't posted, we're, we're going to do that announcement like a, in a few weeks as, as soon as we kind of figure out uh, regarding COVID, what, what's the best way to treat the infection risk during the, the event, since it's going to be a very intense event with a lot of people, we don't want everybody to be getting sick, so we got to make sure we've got a good handle on exactly what that, that's like, because that's, we're looking at like, like a couple of hundred people. So that's going to be oh, okay. Two hundred people, though. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're talking about some serious, major, major progress happening. We're going to build some more infrastructure here, like another workshop and and more living space. So we've got a lot of lot of work before then. Um, but essentially, if you want to go with the flow of the three D printer and build that and and diversify into the other things, I mean, the other things are on a critical path because for the construction work, we're going to use three D printers, tractors, and other tools, so it's all relevant. So, so I'm just trying to understand what you said. So, you're basically saying the 3D printer uh, derived uh, produce parts are a prerequisite for tractor and uh, house and all that, is it? Yeah. Well, 
Well, to, to clarify that, right now we have built up to the 18 inch bed printer and that works, we're working on that to do a product release of that next, because 18 inches, that's much bigger than the first one, which is the, the D3D Pro, which is just eight inch bed. With 18 inch, yes. that is like eight times bigger. That, that's significantly more productive, which you can print with it in terms of size of the objects. But we have not touched the larger things like we're talking about four by four by eight foot size. So that means a monster printer that you can actually produce real construction materials from four by four by eight. Just imagine, I'm sorry, four feet by four feet by, oh, that's huge. That's huge. That's talking about building up to the full panels of the houses that we're building right now. That is no joke. That's some major industrial productivity. And that's, Perfect. and that is a, a much larger, more powerful printer. And then think about using a similar framework, a, a larger printer like that as well, where now you put a, uh, turn it into a metal printer by simply putting a, a welder head instead of the extruder head. Well, that's what I wanted to ask you. Will printing possible with the 3D printers? Because big companies are investing in that here. That is not mainstream. The, uh, the guy I met, he's only into FDM process and plastic, uh, you know, 3D printing. Already, there's, know, there's two ways to do. You're asking about metal. Yeah, yeah. Can you make? Can you 3D print with metal? Yeah, you can. Using our technology without changing the technology, there's two ways to do it. One is where they take the print head actually has lasers on it and you're doing laser sintering. So that's how, for example, SpaceX prints their rocket engines. They take a laser-based 3D printer and metal powders. So there's a powder bed and wherever the laser passes with its beam, it solidifies, it sinters, it literally melts the metal and goes up layer by layer like that. It shakes a new layer of metal powder so you can print yeah. in titanium, whatever, stainless steel, whatever. That's a different technology. We're not doing that. What we can do, well, we, we can develop that. That, that's, that would be the R&D side. That means you're, instead of putting a, a 3D printer extruder head on, you're putting a laser head on the, th the 3D printer and you're working with metal powders that are in a bed. So it's a completely different kind of a system. Well, I mean, the idea is still this. It's still a 3D printer. It's just a way, uh, a different form of a 3D printer. But what we can do readily and today, right now, is put a MIG welder head instead of using the, the 3D printer plastic extruder. With the welder head, yeah. that means you're going in three dimensions and, and with a welder, uh, you can lay down beads that are accurate to within like three millimeters so you can make large parts like the actual tubing for the tractor you can make like wheels and sprockets which don't require the super fast su super high precision but you can also take those shapes and you can post process them by milling just mill off a little bit to smooth them out uh, so you're you're doing 3D printing either like with direct parts, which you can do for a lot of different things, or you can actually machine it afterwards to get it smooth so you have a super precision part. But that's the, the metal printer. I mean, if you want to talk about that, if you want to develop that, uh, the idea is the base 3D printer now can branch off into all these things, the much larger printer or the printer that allows you to print in metal. And now you're talking some serious in industry when you're printing metal parts. So, for example, a wind turbine tower. Think of that. You know, yeah. things like that. Uh, just crazy, much larger things. You can print a, a boat. I've, I've seen wind uh, turbines in India. I've been to my friend's place. I've seen huge, huge ones. Yeah. The towers. Yeah. All of the. That but, tower, but the idea is that with the 3D printer, so you learn to do CAD work and you do the basic building of the 3D printer, which which allows you intro an introduction to various forms of metal fabrication, as well as the ability to print plastic parts, like for example, seats or the tires for the tractor. That's called rubber printing. Like nobody, for example, right now, 3D prints rubber tires that I know of, but that's something that's readily doable.
Yeah, and you can do like solid rubber, which would be for puncture proof tires, or you can do pneumatic, where you you print the tires just like they are in cars. It's amazing yeah. stuff, and it's like it's relatively low hanging fruit. I mean, it takes development, but that's I mean, it's so amazing that now we have the the ability to do what Goodyear, the, you know, the rubber company does. You can do that right in your backyard, you know, things like that. That's good. That's good. That's good. So that's the power of 3D printing. It's essentially a three-dimensional uh, motion axis that you can do anything in there. You can you can use that to print uh, if it's a bigger, much bigger version and print the housing, print the print the mud or or cement for walls, things like that. So it's just a generic technology. So probably what you want to do is like once we get far enough on the printer, uh, you know, you get the basic skills of design. But I mean, hopefully you contribute significantly. Like what I wouldn't want you to do is just like jump from one thing to the next. You just learned it and then you did it and then you haven't documented what you learned because uh, I would like you to definitely document. Like for example, getting the full CAD that would be a great milestone or the complete super complete like production instructions maybe think about it as okay um, my milestone may be I do the complete uh, build instructions and production documents so that I can just outsource it and start getting that my buddies to produce it for yeah. you and you can uh, be making money documentation it becomes work later if I don't document now later tomorrow if I have to ask somebody to do redo my work I'll have to go back and redo it it's better to document parallelly document is a bad word for it maybe I have to parallelly log it or make a memo of it as maybe because yeah. documentation in companies is a very boring word nobody likes it in software companies yeah uh, but, but I also create a memo of a accurate you know it, it's very important to make notes in life I think not just about machines or Absolutely. 3D printing it's very important to make That's what cool. we learn about yeah, there's a technical term for that. It's called time binding, the unique human capacity to build upon prior knowledge. But I also, what that it's called time binding. It's a concept from general yeah. semantics. But I want to emphasize one thing. You said it's going to happen later. Because if you don't document... No, no, it should not happen later is what I'm saying. It should happen later. It yeah, should not happen later. But let me, tell you, happen. let me tell you another insight. It's not going to happen later because that's how these things work what happens is that you end up you did that and you don't really have the notes you have some scrappy notes so first of all like nobody else can build upon it right and then the second thing is after you did it you're like oh wow it's much more exciting for me to do the next thing so you never end up documenting the former stuff i can tell you that's what happens because that's you know i've been in this that's pretty much a very common thing it's not that you can do it later, it's that you don't do it. That's that's the problem. And that's why society is not developing as fast as it could in terms of collective genius being created and progress of society in general. But anyway, um, I think... If I had put up on the OSA this one, the, uh, the log is not supposed to be a chore uh, in itself and uh, exactly. you have to fill it up with things, but what is essential fill that up? I think when documentation is, documentation is essential or not flowery, right? That has to be done. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. But about some format, some font, or some flowery language, some introduction, no. some summary. But about getting the essentials, which is essential for the other person to take or and use, that is very important. Exactly, exactly. To the point, documentation, computer-readable documentation, or you know, where a sub it makes sense, you know, step-by-step -step instruction, as yeah. much as it. So that kind of thing is. Yeah. And the other thing I would want to emphasize is like as you go forward is uh, I did mention about investing in camera equipment. So get a tripod so that whenever you're doing anything you have not even one but even a few cameras like taking time lapses or videos. I think wh what I do here a lot is just set up a time lapse as I'm working so then I have a record of this. It, it also shows you not only the directions but also how long it took you. And, and and you forget stuff so having that record then you can post it online and others can learn from it others can actually edit it and draw interesting information out of it like for example the other day I reviewed my videos on painting staining the wall panels for the house so I'm actually getting real data like I figured that it takes me nine minutes per panel to spray paint each panel you know data you get real data out of it 
just by analyzing yeah. the video. And it's the stuff you wouldn't have time to do. You don't, you know, it's if you're busy and dirty, like it's kind of hard to document, but that's, that's where the cameras come in. If you're set up for that, then you can capture a vast amount of information without having to worry about it. And then you just take the SD card or upload it to the internet or just have it, have it available so that you can share it. Like that's, that's what I'm gonna ask you. It's like when you're doing a build, have that camera running. So first of all, like uh, one, it's uh, documenting. The second thing is the feedback. I can then feedback on it. You're gonna tell me, oh, this is not working. I don't know how to solve it. And then I can just take a look at the video and say, oh, this is exactly what you, you need right there. Cause I can see it, you know, things like that. I pass on that part initially at least a little bit sensitive because you know you know I I I don't know if the camera is looking to other time the whole world is going to see it later and I mean you know I don't know. Well, yeah, I mean hopefully I mean try to get your mindset around that. What's coming generally from me or from many people you know some you know it's maybe shyness or nervousness or what do you call it because they say one of the biggest fears that people have is talking on the stage. Yeah. People prefer yeah so people so dying. Yeah, falling off a cliff rather than talking on the stage. Yeah, you know, yeah. It's sort of, it's sort of a mental barrier for me. Maybe right immediately. I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to, unless it's a mandatory OSC thing. You know, uh, once I build once or twice and I get confidence, third time I build in front of the camera. But you know, when I know that I'm making a small mistake, somebody says, "Oh, this idiot made a mistake here." Yeah, you know, but you but look, man, I'm gonna push back on it and say that's how you learn. That's how, like, if if. Let me tell you what that thing gets me. It's like, I can, s just the fact that you have trouble with that, that's data, that's feedback. So I will still encourage you to do it. Because, no, sometimes they not, instead of trying, uh, turning the board, I turn, I turn the nut, you know. It's, you know, those kinds of things, some pieces, why are you doing this? Yeah, but that's the things we're gonna have to put into the build guides. We're gonna say, don't do it this way, do it that way. And I know that because- Yeah, that's all the data will come through. All the data will come through. But when somebody see you make a, a silly mistake or, you know- uh, Yeah, but I mean, wrong. there's not gonna be a lot of people looking at it. It'll be just in our, you know, initially there's, it's just pretty much no one looks at it. But just have it available. Um, please. Yeah. Yeah, I'll try, I'll try, I'll try. But please give me some time to cope up with that emotional aspect or, you know, the strength to build that, uh, you know, what you Well, call? I mean, we should talk about that. So, so, I mean, let's just talk about it for a little, little bit. Like, so what? Like, so you're building it, you're showing people, well, you're just documenting a, a learning process, right? I mean, in a company, they might actually, you know, like the, you hear on, on uh, some phone calls. This phone call is being recorded for quality control purposes. Yeah, it's actually learning. You know, um, so it's it's okay. It, it can. There's definitely validity to people being snooped on for the purpose of learning. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I, it's, but please give me some time to build up yeah. the emotional strength for this. I mean. The first, but once probably, I'm comfortable with something I wrote on camera, not a problem. But until the time that I've rehearsed it once or twice. Yeah, but, but then let me just uh, tell you about that. So, um, but you see that, so you, you don't see the value of like showing that a person struggles with something? Because that's, that's actual data that says this part is hard. And that means for me, it might mean, well, I'm going to need to redesign that because uh, people are having a hard time doing it. Like if I see that, like, okay, there's something that is in a design and it's really too challenging, then I want to change it because I want to have the simplest to build thing in the world. The best, simplest, fastest, better, better, faster, stronger uh, on all levels. So I'm just saying there's, there's a lot of data that, especially in the build process, like unless you're making a super final video yeah. That'll be like the, yeah, that we definitely want to do afterwards and all that. As you learn, no, I wouldn't say just get the perfect video out there. I wouldn't say that. But basically, you integrate it to some decent professional grade where somebody, you know, the focus should not be on why is he putting the wrong screw here, why is he tightening the nut and screw screw up. Just to give a very crude and basic example. Instead, okay, that is the way things have to happen. Step by step, clean, crisp, and straight to help anybody to actually, you know, yeah. this is the way to do it. Yeah, yeah. 
That I mean, that's definitely so, bad. Even Phillips, even in Phillips, when uh, Phillips stars are there in front of the camera and the, the director gives them dialogues to rehearse and actually voice out on the stage or the in front of the camera, they have multiple takes. Take one, take two. In the United States, we have take twenty also. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like what? I, I yes. think you have to differentiate between the development part because see the people who take you know you've got ten takes for a scene, right? Yeah. Well they have to have that footage in order to get the final footage, right? They're in development process, right? That's kind of how it is. It's like development process, we're learning from that. Uh, I think that's a decent metaphor to say that there's stuff to be learned. Uh, definitely we want to do a final good version, but if you can, it doesn't cost you a lot to do that. And if you, I mean, if you want, we can just have them in those, that kind of stuff internally we don't have to publish that we can say this is this is private and then at the end we we can say this is the stuff we're gonna we're gonna edit that and we're gonna publish it but okay, it was, that's fine because i thought all osc communication was open so i'm so a bit nervous yeah if i no that's fine then then we can take take from it's largely like i want to see some of that because i can provide a lot of feedback or some other team members but in practice it's like um the fact is like when when we have a bunch of this this data like nobody looks at that they don't care they want to see the final pretty pictures so uh, but yeah we can we can uh make that make the work we can have things like working folders of videos like i mean for example in my google folder i have some video that's just private and stuff stuff that's clearly like pu for public uh, but other stuff that might have sensitive information or is is uh, i mean i don't share everything so, yeah, we can, we can do that. Yeah, and uh, you know, just to comment on that, why why I do encourage that is that if you, uh, once again, the publishing early and often part is that people can catch some things in process because if other people are looking, they can make improvements. That's that's just the general concept, and I think that's quite valid. Yeah. Okay, well that's so that's the. I, mean, I could definitely get there. I'm not saying I wouldn't do that. I'll definitely get there, but I need some emotional strength to come to that level of confidence. Yeah. There are some people who are all very extrovert people. They don't mind showing off everything. There are some people. I'm selectively introvert, selectively extrovert. So. How would you? How do you describe yourself? Uh, like most common people, some parts are introvert, some parts are extrovert. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For example, I uh, the games that I play, I sometimes shoot videos. You know, sometimes that's a motivation to show off, to go and uh, work out or exercise. But other times, it becomes a compulsion. Somebody's looking at you, you have to shoot a video every day. Yeah. I also think that's, you know, like I think the more, as you say, like there's a, definitely a psychological or personal learning phase to that because it's really about becoming super, super comfortable about yourself and what you're doing in a world. Like for me, like I believe that what I'm doing is extremely important and needs to be shared. And that's why with that kind of a conviction, because I think it can help a lot of people. That's why I say, okay, well, I got to share as much as possible. So naturally, like any of those fears that, oh, someone's looking at me or whatever, that's that's completely secondary. Like I, I have a, it's about purpose. Like, why are you doing that? And um, so especially if you if you clarify your purpose, um, I mean, if you believe that, oh, this is actually going to help the world and that is my vision, then yeah, that, that you just break through those kinds of things because but your, I yourself... Sorry. Yeah. I think that as long as personal, I'm more than happy to share it. For example, the way I learn is by teaching. Yeah, so yeah. I took your three minute video, I made it a 30 minute one. And every one of those things I'm posting there for free. No, I mean, uh, you're, I'm saying you're already doing it. So I'm, I, I'm almost like surprised that you say that you have difficulty with it. But you're already doing it. So that's good. That's actually really good. As long as it doesn't involve my personal aspects, anything that I learn is out there for uh, anybody to pick up and learn or reuse. So everything that I do, that is a CAD file or the how to build a step by step thing, I'll make sure it is to the point precise and clearly stated so that people can take a look at it and use it. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. 
That's cool. And I come from a software engineering background. Every single thing has to be, I mean, in an ideal world, you really have to document what is essential. Mm-hmm. Not mm-hmm. do more documentation for the formality sake of it, not to cut corners just because you have a tough timeline or tough deadline. Ideally, you have to document what is essential in a scientific way. Crisp but clear, concise, brief and complete. Brief yeah. and complete. Concise is the word. Scientific and useful documentation. Over documentation again, people will ignore everything. Too much of information is as good as no information. Yeah. And it has to yeah. Sounds fair. So, so the sorry. The way I thought was any company requires three things. I think of this order wherein basically we are trying to create something of uh, you know a global wage construction set, any business. One thing is it requires an R&D team, one thing it requires an engineering team, and finally a team that manages the business. So basically I thought initially first year I'd focus on the R&D team starting with the 3D printer. If I had to parallelly ensure that it brings in money, I'll tie up with somebody and say, look, I'll do the R&D part, you take over, we start a partnership. And he takes from the business, he brings money in. It is better that one person focuses on one thing. And once a guy does learns all the R and D and contributes to OEC in my limited capacity, what will I contribute back in this year or going further as well? Then I can train an engineering team here to actually get into mass production of what is already there. And then a third team does the business part of it. But initially I thought I'll focus on the R and D thing, learn from OEC, and in the process, if I learn something, share it back to so other people at OEC. Other members like me who are learning, they also get to benefit from me. Somebody sitting in Indonesia, for example, or Singapore or Germany, they get to learn. I hope the screen is not freezing. Okay. Yeah. 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 So they get to learn as well. And then uh, once that R&D is picked up, I can train a team here and parallel let somebody run the business. At least initially, let me get, because all of this is based on concepts and engineering when you're creating hardcore products. There's a lot to do with conceptual uh, ground thinking rather than actually uh, getting into some kind of MBA or uh, getting into selling things, we are not there. We are creating something new from ground up. And a lot of it, as you said, runs on scarcity economics, you know, where there is design uh, and uh, IP intellectual property done in one place, mass production done in one part of the world in China, and the rest of the world is just a supply chain and we live in a consumer economy. Somebody has to break that. Somebody has to break that artificial scarcity. And you are doing it and who is doing it? Yeah. So once we get to use junk plastic or junk metal and recreate things, that as you said is a trillion dollar economy or a very big economy. In addition to creating wealth for ourselves, we are actually you know solving problems in poorest countries where you know people can uh, live. They don't get squeezed by rich capitalists. That I'm not trying to take names, but they don't get squeezed by rich countries. Or sorry to say that. Yeah. But you know, the rich countries don't get to set term, get to set terms to poor countries. Right, right. So they have control of their economies. Every economy, every country, dead off, it has to become self-sufficient. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So no problem is also achieved along with making wealth for others. Yeah. That's very important. Yeah. And you mentioned about mass yeah. production. I look at it more as production by the masses, like Gandhi said, where we develop an enterprise, but then focus that enterprise on training others for how to do this successfully. So hopefully, we're we're doing this along the lines of the concept of distributive enterprise that the business should focus a lot as much on education as possible so we're combining production and education now education by itself is not good enough because what are you going to put uh where are you going to get put the bread on your table and then just production itself could be like mass production like china so you you know either is not enough you have you want to have both of them for a really robust business model that then is spread to other places so that you're saying like that rich countries don't dictate other countries everyone should be as autonomous on the smallest scale possible that's just the, the general idea of the distributed economy and imagine we're all collaborating to the bigger picture of the design pool and then everything can happen in local micro factories that are regional based that are for okay, your communities I don't know micro factory I don't know OEC, sorry this local micro factory can you please explain that term in a bigger way I yeah, it's it's a production facility. It's a flexible fabrication production facility that it's not like a massive factory that produces one thing. You know, it can produce many different things. 
and it's, so it's smaller in scale and it can produce more different things and it, it works as much as possible with local supply chains. It's also fueled by the global design effort and then as far as the instantiation, the actual reality, well you got to produce it somewhere. The idea is have this, like if you want to make, make essential products, have as many communities produce them as possible so that they don't get into unhealthy dependence. So it's just the concept of a factory that is smaller and more diverse and pr produces more products because it has a higher flow of information and access to design. Like, for example, if the company has design, if a, imagine if a company had the designs of every other company in the world, then it can produce just yeah. about anything. Well, the challenge there might be the production equipment they might be set up just for one thing well don't set up yourself for one thing use more generic production machinery to make more different things and you can serve more needs because one is a bad number in business as i mentioned so Absolutely. yeah now uh, there's a good book on this topic so i'm not pulling this out I mean, anything i do once again uh I'm not saying anything here. I read stuff, I learned things. The best place to learn about this concept is a book called The Second Industrial Divide. So you might want to write that down. I'm going to okay. put that on your log. The no. Second Industrial Divide. Yeah. yeah. That's a seminal book on the topic of flexible, what's known as flexible fabrication. And it also... Yeah. Uh, it also says that the way that technology has ended up today, like where there is a wholly centralized supply chain, one company makes like one thing and they try to spill that all over the world, that's not necessarily inevitable. That's not what the course of selection has provided as the only option. It's just one option that was pursued because of various political and social factors. It's not the only possibility. There's different ways to do that. And the book goes through other examples where that's historically has been, that has happened. But right now we're pretty much and thoroughly in a world of centralized production. So that, that promise of flexible fabrication is not, not super common. It's, mar it's marginal. Martin, no question. Just a theoretical question that just came up. Very theoretical, very, very stupid question. Mm, no Is it possible no. to 3D print a parts of a cell phone or a smartphone? Yeah. Stupid. Largely stupid. Can you print parts for a cell phone? Yes, yeah, smartphone. Is it? Not, not OAC side, generally as a 3D printer. A very open uh, theoretical question. Because what I heard was uh, an iPhone makes a hundred dollars to make, it takes a hundred dollars to make, they sell for a thousand dollars, iPhone yeah. for example. Yeah, you can get into a lot of different things like, I mean, you're talking about a much more micro scale. You can probably, I mean right now there's not a technology, a 3D printer that prints uh, a cell phone, but you can definitely do it if you develop that. So once again, like the limits of technology, we have hardly scratched them. And it's true that miniaturization, that people can do things on a much smaller scale, smaller scale, that's happening more and more. You can make smaller things, you can make larger things. Uh, so I don't see why that would not be possible, that you can actually print semiconductors. And if you start looking at that, you probably will find a semiconductor printer already. Let's see, semiconductor 3D printer. I mean, I went up to the uh, level of uh, PCB, printed circuit board, or those micro, dead thing at semiconductor level. Yeah, okay, I mean, there's... The last part of the world is, we, I, people here, for example, maybe in other parts of the world, they pick up all these terms and write examinations and come out of school, but they don't know, for example, I don't even know what the uh, properties of a metal are. I don't know what conduction, convection, radiation, for example, in the heat transfer is, you know. That is it's what I, go back to the yeah, I, I went to an advanced degree and I had very little clue of what any of those things are myself. 
you, you just don't learn a lot of practical stuff like when I, I mean anytime I start talking about education it's like for me it's like such a waste the way that things are taught is so out of context and that's why uh, I'm saying for OSC I want OSC to be the next education system it's the next kind of a school where you learn completely applied knowledge about everything ultimately so that you're learning how to be an integrated human it's not, not just technology, it's all the other areas. Yeah. But you're right, we, we are missing so much of this essential, very simple information. It just was like, perv it's like our whole education system has been hijacked or perverted to learning all this trash for, for dubious purposes. To, to <laughs> teach us to be competitive and teach us a scarcity mindset and so forth. Um, I think it's In fact, in the book, uh, Richard Ford and Robert Kiyosaki says, education begins after school. Yeah, well, I, it did for me. That's, that's what happened to me. Anything else? No, we're, we're good. Anything else? Nothing else at the moment. I have to, so my final updates are, I'll get back to the free cat thing. Yeah. Apparently, this guy will help me in the build of, there is one part I didn't understand where you said 25% of it is done, they make 25% of the bomb, you have changed it. I'll forward it to him, I'll ask him to read it for me. And you know, since I'm buying it from him the first time around, let him a uh, uh, little better placed pair of eyes or a better pair of eyes look at it than me. I'll finish this part, I'll get better at this and I'll go, go to him. And then once I get the 3D printer done, I'll parallelly, you know, document every single thing that you said as I keep doing, even if I do mistakes. Mm -hmm. Okay. That way we will have, you know, a complete documentation. That's good. That's good. Yeah, so for now... Well, I can build a printer once, take it apart completely, next time along with the CAD fund, do it the second time. Even that is doable. I don't mind it doing it multiple times. I don't mind extra physical effort. I don't mind it. Yeah. No issues there. That's good. That's good. So in the meantime, yeah, just think about also the critical path document. See if if you can start. I mean, just think about it and and see if you can put any more completion to it. Because once you put some ideas down on paper, they kind of make you think more. And then you that document is to be edited. So just put in as much information in there along a timeline if you can. If you can't, then maybe that's all we can do for now. But Much it, uh, the first thing is we are at the end of Feb right now, so basically uh, till the end of, uh, the next month obviously is March. So uh, you are targeting the end of March as built, uh, nothing is falling between uh, March and April, I mean at the well, end of the month of March. Since yeah, we weren't really that specific there, but maybe like this expands into middle of March until you have everything and then the build, I mean you might be starting like right there, so. so basically, uh, I'll go to what you said. You said initially you would prefer somebody to actually look at the D3D Pro and uh, document the whole process and focus on uh, optimizing the uh, printing process and uh, maybe get it to different kinds of materials. So first part of the year, you are happy to, to uh, for a uh, mentee to work on that. Second part of the year, more flexible in terms of uh, what other products can make, depending on local demand. Yeah. Local demand. But say, uh, <clears throat> the ideal thing, you know, we ha hardly scratched it, but what about the filament maker? You know, that, I mean, I mean, according to this graph here, like we don't have space, like we're doing this stuff. I mean, filament maker would be anywhere here. So, I mean, these are just rough ideas, like the shredding and shredder filament maker slot. Uh, I think the I mean, shredder, the shredder like is super important. Oh, sorry, give the words like uh, filament maker or bed or extruder. These are all, uh, you know, uh, you know, buzzwords until I get to physically see them or tamper or, you know. You even tell me ABS or polyethylene, right? Right. I mean, yeah. Right. Maybe if I get my hands dirty and start uh, fiddling with things and build something, then I'll be able to, you know. Yeah. Otherwise, we'll be talking things to them, actually. Yeah, yeah. I'm just saying that, you know, just the concept is you're taking trash and turning it into 3D printing filament. Uh, that's the concept. I mean, it is important. So if you, if you think about that, it's really about 
asking yourself like okay do I have the do I see the purpose in it because the, the basic c concept is right now a roll of filament costs you 20 bucks it's only a kilo okay. that means we can't so we can make small parts well what does that tell you that tells you you can't make any construction materials because it's too expensive yes 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 so the only way you can do that is if you get the price down 10x or 50x, which is what you do, it ends up costing you about five or 10 cents per kilogram instead of 20 bucks. I might be exaggerating, it might be like 50 cents. 50 cents per kilogram. Yeah, so, so the whole thing there is you, you almost get to filament for almost like free because you can take trash and only cost you the electricity to melt it and to turn it into filament anyway that's you know that's that's getting into the numbers that's getting into okay now here's some numeracy here's calculations where we say hey this is the economic analysis it says it cost me so much so once you start looking at this I mean you can start looking at some economic analysis if you if you want to but that's you know myself knowing that like I want to be able to make whole panels for a house like this to to solve housing that's part of the the promise for the CD co home so I know that in order for me to make that re a reality we cannot do that without using trash plastic and recycling it into new filament that we can print with so that's just the reality I, I can appreciate right now. But yeah, the first thing is you want to build a printer and get some of that reality so you see its basic performance and limits. It'll teach you a lot. And then you'll, talk, you'll see how fast it prints. You'll see uh, how much it costs to print and things like that. What are its limits? And then you'll be like either, wow, okay, now I get some reality checks, some data that you can go forward with. Yeah. Yes, Martin. Martin, currently, uh, when you say uh, cheap plastic, you mean polyethylene as what you're referring to, right? Cheap plastic is any plastic. It could be polyethylene, PVC, ABS, like any of the super common things that everything is made of. Like, well, this, these are so, cheap. Okay, what these companies do is they, I'm sorry, what these companies do is they take plastic and they extrude it and do filament to 3D printing companies, right? That is what what happens do. is, right. yeah, but they don't take waste. They take virgin plastic from Exxon or DuPont uh, they never work with so it's part of the oil industry essentially they don't oh. take the recycling part because it doesn't make a, as much money they can just burn through much more oil and get a lot of money recycling there's not as much money in, in recycling so once again you're talking about capitalism at work capitalism has a less less of a case for recycling lifetime design because that destroys the economy <laughs> but that's what we we need to take ecology as part of the equation here and care about it so the concept is when you when you buy filament typically it's made from virgin pellets that they got from by processing petroleum products uh, so and then the plastic ends up polluting the environment, things like that. Plastic is a big issue, ocean pollution and stuff like that. Um, so here it's, you're not only solving like plastic trash issues, plastic waste, you're now addressing productivity and economic development. So there's a very big case for that to happen because the material is like literally free. Yeah, like tires for example, like toner tires. Yeah, if you talk about tires, you can actually have blends where you pulverize the, the rubber and you use that as a blend so that your plastic filament actually becomes uh, rubbery. You can do things like that. You can put all kinds of stuff into the plastic. You can put, uh, say, sawdust into it and your filament that you print with has like a wooden texture. Uh, so you can print with various blends as well. Like, like plastic itself is an is like a like a lattice that you can put other things in there uh, they also have there's another thing that some companies are doing which is plastic with embedded metal where they pr little metal particles 
So when you print the 3D object, they take that object and then burn out the plastic and you get a solid 3D metal object. There's a hundred different technologies around this. This is like a really comprehensive thing. So it's like all of material science is embodied in, in 3D printing. Very much a more question. Suppose I want to just uh, build a car, how easy is it to uh, build a metal or plastic parts of a 3D printer and assemble a car if you want a car scan design, for example? Is that doable? Yeah, you can do a little bit. But a car and car design open source. I saw that OEC website is an open source 3D car. There's also a uh, separate of a solar uh, mobile vehicle, but I don't know where they are. You know, cars are excited to think of it. Because somebody is sitting in Taiwan, he's developed a bat, bat, what bat mobile, bat mobile. He's developed a complete bat mobile in five months. It's, it's a bat mobile car. Cars. That's already been done. <clears throat> so let me send you a link. I'll put it on your log. It's um, local motors has done a 3D printed car. Yeah, you can do that. Piece of cake. You just need to have the the machine big enough to make the the panels. You can print. You can print. So technically it's possible. Oh yeah, not a problem. Okay, okay. okay. Yeah, so so that's an example. You can uh, start manufacturing cars. That's why you want to do the three D printer. Okay. Yeah, printers are very robust. Like for example, what I look forward with the metal printing, where, where I mentioned about the metal print head, which is essentially a MIG welder. Any of the the heavy machines that we do right now we can then print it out completely with that metal printer. The brick press. It's, it's bulk, bulk rough shaped metal for most of it. Yeah, so possibilities are there. It's, uh, so essentially technological regression, technological regression. Yeah. Because not just are you building a, a brick presser, but you're building the parts of a brick presser and assembling it yourself. Technological exactly, exactly. And then yeah. with precision machines that you make parts for using the 3D printer. So the 3D printer, the two inch or three inch universal axis makes heavy duty precision milling machines. So you take that and now you're starting to make your engines, hydraulic motors and other parts that are precision metal. So there's the whole technological recursion there. Okay. Yeah, so it's, it's a whole cycle of... So, and the micro factory, the idea in the micro factory is that you have all those machines. So you have the complete capacity to work with metal, ceramic, plastic, wood, and everything. So we have a choice as to press this button, build this, any, anything that you choose, you can build that. Yep. That's a fantastic idea. Without having the initial upfront investment required, or capital expenditure required to build an industry for 10 kinds of machines. You have a micro factory which is minimal investment and you can build water as required as per demand, local demand. Mm -hmm. You can build more yeah. things, yeah, more things. And obviously with the idea that when you have more open source machinery, then you, the capitalization, the startup cost becomes manageable so that every community can have this. It's not an expensive billion dollar factory. It's much less expensive, and that way you, you can do this everywhere and leap leapfrog. So any place that doesn't have modern industry, here it is. Here's an industry in a box. Industry in a city or a degree, as you said on the website. Yep, that's exactly. Oh, sorry, on the first time, Yeah, yeah, yeah. The first TED talk. The next one's coming up. <laughs> well, we got to do something first. You know, we laid out the idea. The idea is sound, and it works, and everything is going forward. Now we need some major traction. Much one more question. If I want to share a few things, like for example, there's a toy that teaches structural engineering to children. It's an educational toy. Universe can use. Can I just keep posting links on the OSC page? Whatever I have in mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Know? Definitely. That's okay. To share all sorts of educational things. Yeah, yeah, definitely. The workshops is regarding anything of how we increase our ability to produce things and learn rapidly and collaborate. So, it's definitely to, and especially since you're 
you're going to be here for the summer and stuff, the late summer. Um, yeah, that's definitely fitting. Because we'll probably. Well, say, if I just want to, you know, or, you know, if I just want to look bad on the OSC website, I can keep a link to my Facebook page and post things on the Facebook page. No, you know, it's seriously educational toys. Like, for example, there's a V8 engine toy yeah. that teaches children how a V8 engine works. Yeah, if it's related to building things and getting getting practical skills, that belongs on OSC workshops. I mean, the workshops are a place where you're supposed to, where average people are supposed to learn amazing productive skills. So if that helps, that sounds like that's definitely on track. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions for today? Perfect. Okay. Well, sounds good. Sounds good. So uh, I'll publish this, and yeah, think, th you know, think about the critical path as if you can, because I mean, yeah, there's, um, yeah, there's infinite. Uh, right now, you have infinite options, but you, yeah, just build a printer, get as much as experience as possible, as soon as possible, and then you just continue. Mm -hmm. The the way I'm looking at the critical path is two things. Either it has to be a lot of productivity in terms of a tangible value. Or solving hard business problems or hard problems. Hard problems, for example. Something like uh, uh, the ability to turn uh, uh, waste, plastic, and filament, those kinds of things. Right? If I get an opportunity to contribute, that is one thing. Or maybe the second option is you know, basically anything that is tangible, where I get to build various things. Either one of them is an acceptable option. The third option, where I start, barely start an enterprise, maybe that can wait for some more time. Yeah, yeah. Or I could type with somebody to actually sell things that I build because that starts taking time of the process of building a business takes time of this. Yeah. So it should not lead to the time, the precious time that I have with you for one year. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, whatever's most valuable to you. And the thing is from OSC side, I mean one, the R and D of actual products, that's important. That's that definitely is yeah. a benefit. So so we can't go wrong there. But also the, the business development, the ability to to bootstrap the project is important, but I think we're pretty good shape with respect to the CD go home, where we think that enterprise is going to work, work pretty well. So pretty cool. I don't see, yeah, like if you if you want to focus on a R and D side, that that will work. I mean that's that's a big part of what's needed, too. So yeah, yeah. either of them or both of them rather some some mix of both of them tangible value of creating not not about running the business. And also too, because when I try to do the R&D thing, what I get in these discussions with you is, for example, the PSI thing. Normally, the 3D, the people who run 3D printer shops, they don't think of, you know, there's a high quality kind of discussion that I get by getting an insight into your mind. That kind of, you know, that yeah. quality thinking comes to me as well. That is very infectious. Yeah. Those kinds of yeah, yeah. discussions, that R&D. Yep, yep, yep. And there's... Uh, I'm working on a design guide. I'm, I'm trying to teach this information by documenting this and like how do you design anything and do so collaboratively? Like that is the big thing. That's a very multifaceted process, but yeah, my goal is to be able to teach that effectively and, and mentorship gets you insight to a lot of that. And yeah, we need to do that because I think the bottom line is if people you know, I think that the real missing link is that all the experts that are out there, it's like the tr knowledge transfer does not happen. And that's the gap we're trying to address. Because if people have some of these critical insights, I mean, people can be so much more productive and powerful. And the problem is that most people, like just by the very nature, like any cutting edge information is pretty much proprietary. So the current system just does not do this this transfer of knowledge effectively at all. It's, it's really but guess what? When you Even the policy thing you said, a lot of it is proprietary. For example, if you just take a crude simple example that anybody can understand, because this video is going out to everybody. In a tractor, what exactly is proprietary? For example, I can see the part. software I can understand. There's an executable file, and the source is hidden from me. But in a tractor, if everything is open, is there something that is you know proprietary in a tractor that can I take apart a tractor and see, okay, this is how it works, maybe I can build my own tractor, is that doable or is it, is it well, proprietary for it? You can do that, but what you will find is that there will be various components that are proprietary. Okay, like for example, just take, if it's a hydraulically driven tractor, 
Like, how do you make the the high performance, very efficient hydraulic motor, like on this Bobcat machine or whatever? That's that's trade secrets. You can't just build that because you don't know how. That's that's the deal. Like every company, like I looked at in detail, for example, because I was researching. Well, how do we do an open source Bobcat-like machine? And we're we're reduced to using some of the very common off-the-shelf parts. But when I was looking at it, I noticed, yeah, actually they've got these other components. They're they're like slightly better. It doesn't break our business model. We're, we still kick their ass, <laughs> but. Okay. Um, but I noticed that, yeah, okay, it's, so it's proprietary. Okay, well, there's ju and just about everything. Like, the, you know, the, they might patent the actual design, like certain design feature, like the round corners on a cell phone, on the iPhone, right? Like, were yeah. the, the, corner, the round corners patented? So you can't build it like that? You have to use, you know what I mean? You, you've heard about that, right? Yeah. Yeah, and it's going to be basically every machine's got so many different parts that are going to have at least one patent or 10 or 20. They're like, you can't do this. You can't copy us. You can't learn from us. We're going to kick your ass if you do. That's warfare. We cannot have a better society when everyone thinks like that and everyone thinks like that. So, but you'll find that basically to replicate it with the all the high-tech components not going to be that easy because a lot of them are pretty custom and special like for example uh, Tesla if you want to build a Tesla car yeah. well who's gonna make that electric motor for you they have a very specialized patented motor now Tesla said that he's not gonna he said his car is open source so he will not pursue you if you violate his patent in other words it's like he gave up his patents but in practice, uh, you can't get that motor built by anybody. So I'm, I'm not well, very clear. Yeah, yeah. Even if you're the world plans, you can, it's open source or Tesla. They are no, 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 I mean, they, don't, they don't publish the actual detailed technical drawings. At least I haven't seen them. They just said basically the limit of what Elon Musk is saying is I think that if you decide to copy us, we will not pursue you. But I'm not clear whether that's just marketing speak or whether that's genuine. Because it could be just like, oh yeah, we're open source, we're latching onto that name, versus that he actually wants people to to develop that and sell it. I doubt it because then he would be creating competition for himself. And he's got stockholders that he needs to satisfy. So fact, I don't think that's a genuine offer <laughs> yeah in fact this apple is competing with him on the car thing and they say if apple car comes out that will be a death knell to you know tesla cars and uh, berkshire hathaway has got a big uh, stake in byd build your dream in china that's an electric car again maybe not to the scale of tesla but tesla has got competition from apple cars i mean just a side discussion but yeah 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 so so instead of all these guys competing they you know they could talk to each other and make the best product for everybody but that's not where we're at yet that's the basically the framework we're trying to develop we're, we say hey if you actually collaborate with everybody we can all work on the best design and then monetize it downstream somehow in a different way by selling services and other values around that and that's when they figure out that works for software already they know that they just can't translate that that model to hardware yet okay yeah but it's coming it's it's inevitable because it's just more efficient it's simple business it's simple business sense it's simply more efficient to me it's absolutely inevitable that that's going to happen no question but yeah just not a lot of leadership like nobody in a mainstream industry is really leading any serious discussion about open source hardware transition we're like the only guys that are taking it seriously, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Martin, one more question. One more question. I don't know how to put this across. Since this build of material may take, is, there's a dependency on a third party to give me. 
that should not be a problem and if if he is if he is doing it and do it myself i don't depend on him anymore yeah. i'll give him a second chance i'll give him a second chance he said he'll get back yeah if he doesn't get back, i'll start a parallel sourcing parts yeah. it's not going to work out start buying them one by one i'll start buying them offline online initially to yeah. create a i mean you know so my feedback it is not like it is not like us where and you know everything is online and uh, so you know scientifically or well distributed or highly available there are some very offline shops near my house here there's a yeah. entire huge street or road lined with dozens of shops for hardware and some online has start springing up so i have to go for a combination right now yeah i think that's what you have to do because i don't think uh any single person is a country you know the dark country you know the dark things so i don't just like europe or us we don't have the same kind of you know uh, yeah. equivalent uh, i mean if you want to do well at this business versus be like so we're talking about creating excellence if you talk about creating excellence you i don't think at this stage can just tell somebody oh yeah just figure out all these parts for me and and give them for me i think you have to get that level of expertise in you and it might be a difficult thing but that will guarantee that you have the optimal set because not a single person is going to get you the optimal thing and our thing is so custom and and different than you can't just buy like like we have a design that's it's very i guess it's simple it's focused on absolute lean and efficient and all that but we also are very careful about each part you know each part we selected for that particular way of thinking and i'm just saying of uh, the efficiency part has to be built in there for the kind of excellence that we're going after so i think it probably falls on your shoulder to get that kind of excellence make sure you have access to that so yeah i mean really i mean put some work into that as i you know we started that bill of materials document like kill it just um you know work keep working on that until you're super clear about each part so even when the guys come back to you you can be able to assess the the fit the part fit readily you know cuz if they're going to give it to you then you you'll be asking me it's like okay well does this work no uh just learn it keep studying it keep studying it more as much as you can um so that you know you know cuz i haven't i mean if we look at that doc okay what do we say for that doc we uh the in the bom or is where's our doc where we act oh yeah the admissible parts list so that's a document you you should be working on and I, i'm like we started it but i think you want to we didn't really touch any touch it since we talked but you should probably be looking at this and going part by part and doing things like oh yeah let me share my screen so what i what are some of the things that you can do on it um So for example like you know di part diagrams with critical features you know that's just an example but you can go through like this just like for example here yeah you might have not seen that but or if you have but there's subtleties here and this the, if you understand this you know why this one doesn't work and that one doesn't work but this one and these ones do you know so you got to get to this kind of level of of really mastering which I haven't since you're not working on this document i'm not seeing that being developed right now and i think it should be or well, you'll have to you i mean if you want to turn this into a business into a good business that you don't have any yeah. any blocks regarding supply chain i mean if you're just going to build this kind of like one for yourself it's going to be acceptable but you wouldn't be able to take this to an enterprise level so you know that's uh so you have to make some decisions on where exactly how far you want to take the 3d printer in terms of your goals with it Yeah. No, much. And the sourcing is something that I must definitely work on. And uh, as you said, even you have half a dozen different suppliers for because one guy doesn't have all the components. I'm fine with that. What I'm saying is, rather than looking for online suppliers, maybe I have to go for offline suppliers also here. Yeah. And uh, have alternatives for each uh, component. Yeah, yeah. One component, then I have to have alternatives. Back up. I can't really rely on one component on supply chain and work on it. Yeah, yeah. No, it's true. You want to have as much. But at least, if I in a business, I have to at least stock each of the components in multiple numbers and keep them. 
at some point i have to start stocking them yeah. otherwise i won't be able to build rather than depending on the supply chain buy it and keep it rather than depending on you know future yeah. demand also buy it and keep it and then end up printing more and more of them like for example the bearings um you know that's the kind of stuff we can readily print once we develop the the printing capacity for it we have to develop the production engineering but you don't just say oh here's a file you hit print and print it no you have to there's some insight to that like in order to get an efficient print or a reliable print you, there's first of all settings various settings like or just simple thing like like say you're printing something what is the absolute maximum speed i could print it at and it still comes out really good like we don't know that stuff you can print it one and yeah you can do it slow and will print really well but if we're in production and you want to push the limits of getting most dollars for your time you have to know all those parameters okay what exactly is the acceptable range or actually increase that range put two or four or ten print heads on one printer and get a production printer you know like stuff like that there's all these different things that um, we can keep developing as time goes on. Yeah. Makes sense. Yep. All right. Call it a day? Yep, yeah, perfect. All right. Well, great. So keep going at it and uh, we'll talk. We'll keep, keep going. Thank you much and thank you for your time. Send me those links on all those those health. Absolutely, of course. Yeah. Okay. Take right care. away, right away. And uh, one of them want to us. Okay. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Bye.